by an ardent economic and polit uh, public affairs analyst, Dr. Aliu Elias, on the show this morning. Good Hello, Doctor. Good morning, and Good. thank you for having me. Uh, thanks for making our time to grace the program. All right, thank you so much. Uh, now, there's a lot of concern in the country with the resurfacing of lengthy queues across filling stations in states across the country. And most of the blame is being pointed in the direction of the sole importer of petroleum in the country, the NNPCL. Now, making headline story on about three papers this morning was the NLC report of where its fuel infestation stands out, its stake in Dangote refinery, and its disagreement in the position of independent petrol marketers association who are blaming the NNPC for this resurfacing fuel, fuel queues. I don't know if you've gotten perspective on it or should we revisit the front pages before you make your comments? Right. I think uh, NNPC needs to take responsibility because no matter what, as a so importer of oil, you have to take responsibility when there is queue. However, when I was coming this morning, I tried to look around. I think there is less queue. I hope it will go ahead like that. But the thing is, we cannot say it will not resurface and that's our problem. We are buying it at very high price now and it is not available. So for me, I want to agree with the marketers because I listened to marketer from uh, Lagos State uh, and Abel Kuta, right? He's saying that yeah, there is a lot of tanker on the queue. They don't have even for it to take from the uh, tank farm. And that's a serious problem because that simply means there's issue of supply chain. And I think as NNPC as they are, they should have captured all this that will have enough storage that will capture the challenges and that would have make sure that the gap you know, the gap will not even show like this. So for me, I think NPC need to uh, do more. As we, they also say uh, that maybe September we'll see the uh, Potakot uh, uh, refinery coming. Maybe if that comes up, that would have solved the problem. Perhaps if NPC also, I mean, Dangote refinery as it were, also start producing, I think this will solve, would have cut off the uh, transportation and importation of the uh, uh, fuel to uh, Nigeria. Now, there's also uh, uh, words about confusion on fuel subsidy. Now, the CFO of NNPCL yesterday right. talked about monies owed between January to July owing to the tune of 7.8 trillion naira. And w when I looked at the, 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 the word used there was still subsidy in some way. Uh, for the lay Nigerian uh, listening to this conversation, how do we get perspective of is subsidy regime gone? What is this debt that has been talked about? Right. I think I listened to the NNPC uh, man speaking about uh, the, the, for the past nine years, they've not paid for subsidy. They've not. The thing is, as a layman, you are paying subsidy and there is no language for it. You are saying that you are the importer and you are paying half of it. You know, it is still subsidy. There is no two language. So I think Nigeria is paying subsidy. And it has come clear because for you to get approval to pay from January to to July, that's first subsidy. So for you to be making sure that if fuel is supposed to be 1,200, you're making sure it's 600 landing costs. That means why not even allow the marketer, if you know there's no fuel subsidy, allow the marketer to go to, to and, and import the fuel and see if they will sell at 1,000. Now, when we look at the pump price of fuel in some uh, stations, we hear it's around 950. Right. On the black market, it's right. 1,400. Right. Uh, many uh, looking to understand it from an economic perspective, the removal of fuel subsidy and NNPC being the major player in this game, uh, in the dynamics of free markets and the hope that we have lower prices in uh, the pump price of PMS, how does Nigeria go about it? Right. You know, when we say most of these government policy are premature, people think we are trying to uh, have a, a negative uh, perspective about it. No, it is, it is premature because you cannot remove fuel subsidy and float the Naira. Right, and that's the major problem now. Now you have removed fair subsidy. Yes, we are buying at high price. Government is making money, but you are also spending that money out to go and import because of the first subsidy. I mean, the floating of uh, of naira, and that's why we say if you have removed one, remove first subsidy, and make sure you still control your your for, your, your your effects. That would have helped. But now you have removed first subsidy. And you are floating there, so you are now as well buying at very high price, you know, and that even you cannot even afford to even sell it to Nigeria, you are also paying the half of it. You are even bringing in subsidy in different. So you are taking it by the right hand, and left hand is also bringing it. But and that's why most of this policy are not going to be effective because of the contradiction. Now, now let's just carry our viewers along as well. We'll come to the position of the NNPCL's statement concerning its 7.2% stake in Dangote Refinery. Now, the hopes are high that uh, come the beginning of October, or between then and the end, a crude will be sold to Dangote and other refineries in Naira. But in the interim, 
there's also comment comments where uh, were captured on the blueprint we'll look at again it's a question of what is known as willing buyer yeah. willing seller uh, let's pick up the blueprint as we visit that story on the blueprint away from what the punch is saying you'd find independent petroleum producers crude supply to dangote refinery others must be on a willing buyer willing seller basis uh, please help us uh, put this in perspective the way any nigerian can understand right uh, the fact remains that uh, uh, dangote must have that decision i have co that conviction that is economically viable for him to buy from uh, Nigerian uh, Petroleum, NNPCL, and NNPCL also must make sure that Dangote remain maybe the best buyer uh, for them. You know, the thing is, that's what is called economic of scale. You know, at Dangote as a company, they will sit down and look at it. Well, if I buy from uh, Nigeria, what is the, uh, uh, the what is the benefit of buying from Nigeria? Now, the first thing is that it's going to buy in Naira. That's I'm trying to rule out the benefit. It's going to buy in Naira, right? The the second thing is that it's going, the transportation system is going to be short. There will not be maybe external importation to be from a particular place to a particular place within the the conduct another advance. But beyond that, to globally, you know, you have to look at the long run because if you look at it as it were, Nigerian cannot serve Dangote throughout the year. I think the, uh, the only thing that they can give Dangote two or three supply in a year, maybe out of seven supplies. So if Dangote go outside and negotiate for the total seven supply, and the seven supply come at the very cheaper, you know, the, the higher you buy, the lower the, the price is, you know. If Dangote is looking at it from that perspective, we say, okay, there was no need buying from Nigeria, in as much as I'm buying big from outside, and it's coming at lower, lower price. And that's why the window for uh, willing buyer, willing seller is dead. Also, Federal government also might also have a, uh, some decisions making that if Dangote cannot give us you know sufficient supply of it, let's see if also sell to who that who, people that can actually give us sufficient or if there is a forward contract or exchange contract that okay we give you this you return this. No government have to like prioritize and Dangote have to prioritize. I think it's a good one and that's why that's why everybody must come up with a good deal. So it's willing buyer and willing yes. seller. So it's not a component. Perhaps you remember that there are some modular refinery also that will have in engine. They are also buying from from federal government. So these are the things they will put uh, in place. Because if you sell to Dangote and you not sell to modular refinery, you know it becomes a problem. If you sell to Dangote and you not have uh, oil to use in your potato refinery, it's also a problem. So there will be that interest. No, what do we do first? What is advantage? What do we have a better adva comparative? advantage so i think it's a good one to open it to a willing seller and, and that will give the room for demand and supply to make sure they are at equilibrium whereby there will be if uh, everybody will be at the break break even level which is good now, now further understanding this market dynamics much like you explained right there's also the concern following the issue dangote had earlier on on the quality of diesel and the revelation that came out that dangote's diesel is one of the most sought out after in over 90 european countries now the concern is that this moment the nmpc is reporting 9.3 trillion naira of petroleum imports maybe people are asking would dangote also show preference to selling petrol to the nigerian uh, downstream sector first before attention to the 90 european countries where his business is already thriving right you, you know dangote is a business organization and even is beyond dangote sometimes because people look at it from only Dangote. Dangote is, you know, people come together and work for him. You also have to listen to him to them. So Dangote is going to look at what he prefer more. Nigeria should only appeal to Dangote because it's not easy to have that investment and be conditioned on who to sell to and who not to. So Dangote would like to explore the international market, and you also agree with me that he must have sourced that fund from banks. He wants to get that money and quickly. Uh, pay back. and he's a businessman every businessman is profit oriented so that profit oriented is what we are looking at but the thing is if government can do their own part by supplying dangote selling to dangote in era dangote will not have reasons not to also replicate the the the, the sales of uh, such uh, petrol pms and all that he's even selling this day to nigeria already he's selling aviation fuel already and you could see the margin at least maybe 100 naira and what have you it's still good thing so for me i think dangote should be uh they should allow dangote to be open to business perhaps let me see surprise you nigeria is still the largest market for dangote now i was listening to one um, uh, analysis and they're talking about Botswana. that Botswana has agreed to be buying from dangote and i look at the population Botswana is maybe Two, two, two or three million population. The, the smallest state in Nigeria, like Baesa, is still bigger than uh, uh, Botswana. But you have 200 million 
people and about 150 million potential buyer so you don't have choice than to uh, do business with ninja so i think dangote will also consider the people and the country that can buy from him more now very interesting perspectives from uh, dr ali with this morning as to what the future holds for nigeria ahead of the began the resumption of sales to dangote refinery in october where crude will be sold in nara now beyond this is also the nnpcl stands on what ipman is saying is the cost for the current lingering queues around filling stations now let's delve away from this to another aspect of our economy that has also drawn concerns from nigerians now earlier on on the guardian newspaper we looked at the situation with custom duties and a recent fluctuation that has seen custom duties as reported by the guardian change over a hundred times in 2024 now this spike is reported to also affect the prices of goods now, let's just pick up The Guardian again before we get our doctor's perspective. Now, the lead story reads, Custom spot rate adoption, duty FX rate shifts 100 times in 2024, spikes prices of goods. Now, The Guardian also goes on to show the different spikes. And currently, the duty rate in terms of the exchange is well above 1,580 naira per dollar at the, the custom window. Now, this has been one of the challenges with Nigeria, largely an import-driven economy. Uh, this continues to bother a lot of persons that we don't have stability in the exchange on the custom FX rate. Right. I think we have issue with policy some sort, and that's a major problem. And that's why some of us will say, don't continue to look at uh, monetary policy. Please come and look at fiscal policy, too, because this is purely a fiscal policy. And if you have changed it about 100 times, you know, that's why I like the expository part of guidance this people actually these days i could to the editor so i i think we need to look at that area very well because if you look at cost of goods now it's not only that um we are looking at monetary even fiscal policy if you go to go to import anything and that's why when they say the open window for importation of rice as i said no it won't also make any sense because you have to pay a lot of the, even the rigo it is it's a problem for you to even clear a 40 feet container you know from port you know that it's something that you have to part a lot with and you have to transfer it to the the last uh, the consumer so for me i think customs have to look at it very well. common cars that you buy at 2.4 million has gone as far as higher as 6 million you know that's a very open uh, uh, about one over 100 percent uh, increase so i think government should take look into that critically because once they keep on you know fluctuating and there's policy so much it won't have a we won't have balance of trade people will think well if it's much more would they let me import to other other country and they will engage and now that we are even talking about uh, african free trade uh, area that means it won't be benefit to nigerians because if people are taking things to every other country they will think nigeria is not a good uh, uh, destination perhaps we're supposed to take advantage of that for the uh, uh, afct a because we have more population and we have even the purchasing uh, power i must tell you if you go to africa you know i haven't been to some of the countries you see that nigeria still have the best purchasing uh, power so if we don't take advantage of afcta uh, agreement uh, trade area it simply means we are not, and the best way to do it is to look at it from the uh, custom perspective you know you must be consistent not bring this policy you know though it's not even only a fiscal policy if you also look at monetary policy there have been no you know flip-flop though they are changing it every now and then and we still don't have a, a right uh, area to really focus on so you cannot predict if you are bringing something from abroad now you can if it's two weeks now you cannot still predict how much you're going to pay uh, when you arrive cost of where you, you don't know how much you're going to pay and that is a serious problem because it won't allow you to plan and it will affect uh, foreign direct investment now a lot of nigerians are concerned ever since the president constituted the pecc to look into issues of the economy there's been little attention given to the custom duty issue but for the guardian much like you commended them bringing it to the spotlight even when duty-free weavers were given on the importation of certain commodities many people still raise this concern but it was more or less waved aside how does the pcc attend to issues like this and make them issues of prominence well the fact remains that if you look at uh, you know we have said it over time that uh, when you talked about uh, 
our ease of doing uh, business, which is very, very key. Most of our ease of doing business has to do with paper. You know, when you want to register at CAC, instead of you use one month to register your company, they say you can use two weeks. It's beyond that. We must work on our supply chain. And the major corridor of supply chain is the custom. You know, you know when you are talking about supply chain, you know, the movement of items from the manufacturer to the consumers. You know, the problem is that at the point of transportation, at the point of clearance, you know, that's where the challenges comes. And that's where the delay comes. That's where the price uh, increment and everything comes. And that's why we see by the time things we get to the door mouth of the, of the user, it becomes very, very exorbitant. And it's affecting us because we don't even have that purchasing uh, power. You could see most companies are even complaining. And that's why most of them are closing shop. Because if you use a whole lot of money to uh, clear your goods, how much are you going to sell it to Nigeria? So I think we must... And even coming up with such a group as well to look at uh, businesses, I think we should always do a bottom-up uh, approach. approach. Because if you bring people who are at the top and are bringing in large quantity, they are enjoying the economic of scale. In fact, most of them, most of those people also, if you ask me, they are even ex uh, enjoying free tax. Some of them are working in free trade zone. You know, those people will not make, feel the impact. Of those custom problems, but people that are doing small, small uh, business, MSME, manufacturing companies, they're the one that will feel the impact. So I think we should go beyond uh, rhetorics and beyond paperwork on ease of business. Doing business, we should work on the supply chain process itself. Now, the supply chain process has been fingered as one of the areas the Presidential Economic Council needs to turn its attention to in light of the frequent changes in the FX duty rates. And Nigeria is largely driven by importation and whilst business players and entrepreneurs in the space find it hard to grapple and project as to what the custom duty would be when their goods arrive, it has also affected the ease of doing business. Now, in the opinion of Dr. Aliu, these are areas of priority to ensure that uh, our economy has much of the relief we're looking for. Now, in leaving that uh, headline story, let's also turn our attention to another one uh, making the rounds and this is in regards to the invitation as issued to the nlc president comrade joe ajero by the nigerian police now and his counsel and counsel to nigerian mm -hmm. labor congress uh femi falana san did make excuses for why he refused to honor the invitation and said he'll be only available in seven days time now this has become one of the pressing issues and people are wondering how the nlc is now being linked to allegations of terrorism financing treason and uh, Mr. Joe Ajero, many would say, has uh, some of the traumas of having been assaulted quite recently and might be one of the reasons why it, the NLC is being sketchy about honoring this invitation. Right. Uh, it is in the right of Nigerian police to invite any Nigerians uh, for questioning. But however, you know, when, when there is trust deficit, it becomes a problem. In the case of Joe Ajero, you know, Joe Ajero have trust deficit for uh, the Nigerian police. And perhaps, if let's even look at it. The Nigerian police gave him 24 hours to uh, present himself. But ideally, it's mostly seven days or a week so that he could have a preparation. Perhaps, as, as NLC, as it were, as the president of Nigerian Labour Congress, he has a lot of responsibility, a lot of things to attend to. And that's why I think that's the reason why the Femi Fallon or the legal counsel to him said he's going to present himself in seven days. They never said they will not attend it, that, but in seven days. But let's talk about trust uh, deficits. You recall Joe Ajero suffered a lot from, uh, you know, is it November 2023 in uh, Imo, whereby he was malhandled, assaulted, you know, a lot of things. And perhaps if you look at even this developing story, you know, first and foremost, we see that the Nigerian police went to the uh, labor house and they said they went to maybe trace some uh, foreign terrorists or what have you at second floor but they find their way in 10th tenth, uh, uh, tenth floor and they said they carted away with some document but nlc is saying they took their document they said they never go there to look for nlc somebody is occupying that uh, their office space and that's the person they went for but as the uh the, the story evolved you see that now they are now saying that it is linked to the nlc and the president that they are now inviting the labor but i think uh, the general police also should come 
claim in this case because it's as if they are trying to find a way to tame, you know, you know to actually, uh, you know, deal with it. Perhaps they even went there at 8 p.m. without informing the uh, premises uh, owner, which is NLC, and now they said they find a document that link the. Uh, so for me, I think there's serious issue of a uh, trust uh, deficit. Our uh, police should be much more uh, professional in handling this kind of case. Then, Joe Ajero is not beyond the law. He will surely present himself. I, but I think uh, it, there's a threat also from Labour uh, uh, Union, even international and even TUC, that if Joe uh, Ajero is being arrested, what have you, that will be a strike. We don't want strike in Nigeria as it were, because we know the price of uh, any any strike government will lose in state government will lose even individual will lose and a lot of things will be you know will, will suffer so we do not want so we want them to take it cautious, uh, uh, in a cautionary um and however you know governments and labor you know perhaps there's the issue of the uh, end bad governance you recall that Joe Ajero came out and said uh government should uh, protect the protester you know maybe this is part of what is linked to a uh, issue of uh, joe ajero but i think labor leader is expected to be an independent voice who also speak who always speak about what they think it's good for the for the country perhaps they have come to a truce by government giving them seventy uh, thousand i was thinking that would have uh, solved the problem we still see the uh, the the case really is ugly ugly head going forward now you mentioned some very salient points i'd like for us to just pick on them and talk about them again now it, it's the position of the threat from nlc as a union 54 of its affiliate unions are also vowing to back the position of nlc if they perceive that uh, their precedent is malhandled by the police by going on a strike now whilst the allegations against his person can be removed from his office how do these conversations find balance because if indeed the dealings or the allegations are anything to go by is it in his position as nlc president he's been arrested or as an individual since it is charges of treasonable felony that are part of this terrorism financing well i, I think if there is any personal issue that i had with uh, a police or a trace they, they should let him come down from the position of nlc because even uh, a common man on the street will know that this case can be traced to his position as NLC uh, president. You know, he spoke as NLC president when he said, end bad governance, people should be protected. He speak from the position of uh, NLC president. And before he become NLC president, we don't see him having this type of uh, issues until he become president. Because see, also when he become the NLC president, I have issue with uh, Imo, uh, state gov uh, government and what have you. So I think this this is traced to his position as NLC president. And anything that affects NLC president, I think affects the union and its affiliates. Well, it's an interesting conversation, and we're looking forward to August 29th. The day is set by the Council to NLC, Femi Falana SAN, as the date on which Comrade Joe Ajero will be available to honor an invitation which he shunned from the Nigerian Police Force. As Amnesty International, 54 affiliate unions of the NLC are threatening to ground the economy should they perceive the handling of this matter to be largely biased now many are looking at it from the political motivation of some of these incidences as uh, some newspapers capture it as the police against Ajero. now let's just revisit those group of newspapers as we look to move forward you'd find them captured on the matrix the nigerian tribune and the vanguard uh, let's just refresh your mind as well in terms of what the newspapers say on the matrix you'd find the lead story terrorism financing Fresh showdown looms between FG Labour. NLC Talk Stuff vows to ground Nigeria if anything happens to Ajero. Falana replies police, reveals when Ajero would be available. Amnesty International accuses FG of trying to cripple Labour. Now the Nigerian Tribune has this as its lead story. Police versus Ajero. NLC's 54 affiliate unions threaten mass action if... For more details on that, if you need to pick up the Nigerian Tribune and turn to page two to see it. However, the strap lines read, says invitation politically motivated. NLC's council rights IGP says Ajero will appear next week. Stop this intimidation, judicial harassment, ITC tells FG. Now lastly, the Vanguard also has more on this. The Vanguard says police invitation to Ajero. We would not be silenced, says NLC directs workers to shut down economy if Ajero is arrested. As global worker groups, CSOs, others raise alarm over worsening rights abuse in Nigeria. Why Ajero turned down invitation, says Falana. Demands full details, nature of allegation. 
says that Jerry can only honor invitation August 29. Now, and away from this, uh, three newspapers. The first newspaper now turns its attention to the issue of local government autonomy. As we're told that the secretary to the government of the Federation, Senator George Akume, has inaugurated an enforcement committee to ensure that the court's ruling on local government autonomy is followed to the latter. Now, these are uh, developments that uh, many ask that uh, why is it hard for the rule of law to be expected in Nigeria? If a court judgment has been passed, time has been set for the conduct of local government elections and duly elected council chairman to take over the affairs of local government autonomy, why does it need the SGF to now go further to begin to inaugurate committees to ensure that there's an enforcement of the Supreme Court judgment? Right. Uh, first of all, let me commend the disposition and political will of Mr. President to make sure that this is a decision on local government autonomy is being adhered to. So well, for, it's not out of place for him to bring up an instrument that will make sure that its aim and objective actually work as expected. So for him to come out with a 10-man committee, I went through the committee. I see most of them are still government uh, officials. They are still ministers concerned, like Minister of Budget and Planning. So the, uh, it's, 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 maybe they want it to go directly to the uh, to the local government. But I, I was expecting Algon, uh, Association of Local Government, uh, you know, what have you, to be part of the uh, committee because they are the major people that was going to be uh, benefiting uh, from. However, I saw the representative of governors as well to be there. I think it's very critical because it, we must go beyond rhetorics, beyond uh, saying. You recall that even President Muhammad Buhari, even uh, is, is he, he gave an uh, executive order on it that it should be implemented. They did not implement it. And you have also seen some people from uh, South South West who came out and said we don't want autonomy. We are okay with the way some local government chairman came out and said we don't want autonomy. We are okay with the way our governor is uh, handling the issue of a uh, local local government, which is quite appalling. So I think government going down simply means this government have mind that uh, have the interest of the grassroots and local government operational so that to bring the dividend of uh, democracy as it's expected. Now, now for some uh, states where the elections have been conducted as well, we've seen positions of political party kick, kicking against the outcome of the election saying it's undemocratical for one party to have swept all local government councils. It's also the challenge on trust deficit in terms of the conduct of local government elections. We've seen some debates on the conduct to be left in the hands of the state uh, resident electoral commissions and some are opting for INEC itself at the head to come down and conduct local government uh, elections. How, how do we rebuild this trust deficit and how do we move forward in ensuring local government elections are credible? Well, I agree with uh, that position that uh, there is a trust deficit when it comes to CX, state uh, electoral uh, commissions. Because you cannot have 21 local governments and you have election and you say the same political party actually uh, uh, take over all the local governments. I think it's time now. I think we are moving, our democracy is evolving. Then we are moving gradually close to the uh, solution. So having given us uh, local government autonomy, the next thing is to look at that and that fall on the National Assembly to find a way that the national electoral body will have interest. You know, they may not even take everything as a whole, but they will have a particular role to play in making sure that the uh, winner of every election is uh, duly, duly announced. Because governor, uh, political party, majorly always come uh, to, see, to, to take over everything. Uh, then I saw that before you can even receive those money, and that condition is that you must have conducted your election that's a good one because most of them can use caretaker committee for good three four five five years i've seen successive governors that continue to use a uh, how do you call it uh, a ten, i mean temporary uh, head of a uh, uh, local uh, local government which is not uh, uh, is not good for our democracy so i think by government making sure that the fund goes directly to them the next thing government should do to find a way to make sure that there's always true uh, democratic process in the electing local government chairman in the state now, this is some conversations that also would need your inputs as you join the conversation. Do well to let us know your position on these stories as they continue to develop. Now, now, another issue that has been tied to the rising cost of living in Nigeria is the report of increased fatality. Now, this is reported by the Daily Trust. We hear that 43 persons have sadly passed on. And now with the Nigerian Medical Association, NMA, and the federal government issuing advisories, They've been warning against consumption of expired foods and also the indiscriminate use of preservatives. 
Now, the Daily Trust had this as its lead story. Let's pick it up together as we look at it. On the Daily Trust this morning, it says, Concern as 43 die of food poisoning in two weeks. Farmers and Greek workers blame hoarding, importation of substandard items. FG warns against indiscriminate use of preservatives. Avoid expired products, says NME. Right. You know, you know, we have talked about what is called shrinkflation, which goes around virtually every facet of uh, our consumption. First and foremost, you know, you don't tell an hungry man not to eat a particular food when he does not have an alternative. It becomes a serious uh, problem. I think the level at which hunger and poverty is perverse in Nigeria uh, climate is a very uh, emergency issue. That virtually you could see that even I read uh, five uh, fam five group of five family uh, actually died of uh, food poisoning. They, they are consuming. They thought is a seasoning. They are consuming fertilizer and uh, they put it in the food and they lost their life. So if you look at it now, the challenge is that there is no purchasing power for people. So we everybody look for talent. I can also tell you bread. Ideally, bread don't last more than two more than a week we've seen bread that is lasting for uh, three weeks so what does that mean there's a preservative uh daring that is making it to last which may be uh harmful to uh nigerians and it's a serious uh, uh issues concern about food consumption people just consume what they see you can see people are even come if when i was much younger there's what we call is it alabo so we it's very real food you know people hardly consume it it's seen as you know but now it's now what everybody uh, consume so a lot of things are coming into food uh, uh, consumption i think is the function and condition of uh, uh, the state of the economy you know the purchasing power of people the how expensive you know gary has to be common man food right that even people some people even say i don't want to take gary because i have alternative but to, for you to take gary now you need to expend like 700 to 800 naira you know if money that could even buy you a bit of food before now so it's serious uh, problem and that's why we must work on our food supply chain too. you know we keep on talking about food 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 hunger is serious and uh, like president uh brother Metinu will declare state of, state of emergency on food security right. july 30 2023 up to now we are not seeing the uh, resultant uh, effect positively on nigeria so it's a serious issue we must be self-sufficient in terms of food production if we don't even have that it simply means we are losing it and that's the result of what we are seeing that people are consuming food poison people don't have choice again you know it is when you have money you look at alternative to this alternative to that but now anything you see is just what you consume and it's a serious issue now now the challenge here is it almost feels like a year after following that declaration yes. and following concerted efforts in even giving tax weavers to import more food nigerians can barely afford to feed how does the government adequately ensure that there's improved food production at a time when food inflation is well over 40 percent well if you look at it, presently we have flood problem you know, when you have flood problem, what does it result to? That simply means you are going to suffer it in terms of food production. And I was expecting that immediate government declare state of emergency on food, there will be irrigation or around uh, uh, farming that would have taken care of that. And we still have a legacy issue, issue of insecurity. Most of uh, middle belt that usually, you know, seen as food basket of the nation are having it difficult to go to their farms because that's why they say government should now prepare now to have another security that will be securing these people because they, before they can go to farm and remember we're not even doing mechanized farming it's mostly subsistence uh, farming even within that subsistence farming we cannot still go to our, our farm this becomes a serious issues go to a lot of state now people need to get extra security before they can go to the farm now we also hear news that the united states has announced 27 million dollars humanitarian aid for nigeria the challenge is uh these are not the first of such announcements. Facilities have been sent, investments have been made. The agreed value chain was supposed to have been bettered by the Ankle Boras program. Uh, where do you think we get it wrong when we assess such funding and we fail to yield the resultant effects that it desires in improving our food production? Right. If you remember, we have this uh, Akin, is it Akin, Akin with me? This uh, current addition Akin with me, this current uh, AFDB uh, chairman. You see that if you look at his effort during his time, there's a way he monitor and he talks directly to the farmers. And before you know, it's bring about good produce. So I was thinking this government should embarked on such a strategy too because look at Ankor Borua is political is they are majorly political uh, farmers are even government finding different and that's why some of us said CBN shouldn't be involved in those things give it to Bank of Agriculture Bank of Industry that have 
responsibility of actually uh, handling such uh, cases. So I think they have to strategize more and making sure farmers are given much more opportunity. And that's why we said even federal government allocation that have increased to uh, about 1.3 trillion. Now you can see Niger State gov Governor, he called himself Farmers uh, Governor. And if you go to the state, he's doing exceedingly well in terms of purchasing attractors and making sure that they have very large farm managed by the government and also encourage the private sector. So I think each state must have such projects so that we can actually reduce these uh, ch challenges of uh, food crisis in Nigeria. It's quite appalling that with this our arable land, we cannot still feed ourselves sufficiently. It's quite appalling. There's a point you made about ensuring that uh, there's security on the farms and farmers can go back to their farms, especially in agrarian states, the Middle Belt states. Uh, the, the challenge has been about providing the boots on ground or even curbing the farmer header issues that are said to be the results of this. There's also issues of cattle rustling, land grab grabbing, and President Bola Metinibu decided to go about it through the route of establishing a commission to handle livestock management in, in Nigeria. Uh, in assessing that establishment, can we really say that it has solved the problem of the day? Well, I, I think it's even a ministry, if I get it correctly, yes, Ministry of Livestock. Now, if the ministry, ministry has not come up, that's another problem because, you know, Nigeria, look at about three things now. Nigeria will say we have ministry, but they have not commenced. Uh, a supply of uh, crude oil, it is uh, 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 October and uh, September. You know, you also look at this one that they said is October as well, the LG uh, autonomy. I think we, we keep on pushing those things. What we are supposed to do it with immediate effect you know that's the problem so i think this livestock it's a good one if that will solve the problem of a uh, cattle rustling headers farmers crisis even uh this uh what do you call it bandits if this will solve the problem of bandits on farm and what have you i think we have to do it on time you know a delay will bring a more thing. so once government is called government of President Bola Metinibu is now one year, uh, four months. Before you know, next six months now, they'll be thinking of another election because we know that in Nigeria, once it's two and a half uh, to your, you know, to your government, we start looking at the other other side. And but I think government should be quick to do it. I listened to the Minister of Agriculture; they are actually working. But you know, working and not effective is not what we expect. Once you are working, you must work in uh, connection with the state. And the local government you know remember state is the owner of lands i don't think federal government own any lands but states have lands everywhere so they should start and partner with them to have different farming uh, plan and make sure that they also educate and orient the farmers because you know farmers now need more education the world is changing you know you have to understand the soil very well to know how and perhaps there's a serious issue of climate change what we experience past 10 years is not what we are experiencing uh, now. So I, that's why I think they need to do it. And state must be involved in making sure that they have solution to farm uh, uh, challenges. Now, un unrelated, some of the issues great in the front pages that I'd like to get economic perspective and hope that the viewers also understand the dynamics of what this Im imply uh, is a report that uh, diaspora remittances inflows have surged by 130 percent to $553 million in July, according to reports from the CBN. Uh, what, what does this do for our economy at this point? I think it's a, it, it, it a good one. And that's why we said that diaspora remittance is a very good way to actually look at this. But you know, they have more money. People abroad now have more, more money because of the value of, uh, the uh, of the currency. So they have more money to send down to the to the country. But it's a good one because you know, when we have liquidity, a lot, a lot of... Uh, fx liquidity it helps us to actually money and it gives us a balance so with, with time i think maybe with this one that and uh, cbn has announces maybe with time we'll see now the reduction in what in uh value of uh, you know dollar in nigeria because it's about 1500 by the time we have it at 1800 that's our expectation that would have given us a balanced uh, economy i think it's a good one and kudos to them because if you recall cbn has come up with over 40 uh, times of uh, intervention, policy making, and what have you, to make sure that they have uh, a better uh, remittance uh, to, to Nigeria. I think it's good because you know why? Scarcity of uh, foreign exchange is the major problem. So if there's enough, you know, there won't be, you know, people will not pursue it and it won't have that kind of value 
uh, to make sure that the Nigeria value uh, Naira is actually devalued. So I think it's a good one uh, for CBN and kudos to them. We want them to keep uh, working on it, and it's also looking to the NPR because you know, in as much as you are trying to solve the economy, you're trying to have uh, inflation coming down. You must also not sacrifice the growth of the economy because the uh, MSME manufacturing sector finding it difficult to actually, uh, you know, get. Uh, uh, um, uh, what the loans to actually run their business and a good business need loan to run it. Now, lastly, there's also one of the responses from the government in terms of looking to cut down on the cost of governance. The report is that the federal government has slashed COP29 expenditures, saving over 10 billion naira. Uh, it is more in line with the cause of how much foreign travels cost Nigerians. And at this point, does this show? Uh, sensitivity on the part of the government. Right. I think it's always interesting and a good one if the governors, I mean the government's uh, response to people yearning. You recall the last COP29 have a lot of, uh, is it COP20, we call it, have a lot of control vast in terms of the number of Nigerians who actually uh, went. I think I listened to uh, Julian Gilali when he was trying to say that they have, have a format whereby it's only people that are supposed to be there that are going I think it's a good one for them if they would have, you know, part, like we normally see that Nigerians are paying more price while the federal government are feeding uh, fat. So I think with this gesture, that simply means they are listening to us and they don't want a backlash uh, like they have uh, before. So I think it's a good one. Uh, but COP29 has to have some private sector too because that's what may actually make it uh, much more better because... You know, private oriented has to also orientation has to be uh, worked on too in terms of climate and climatic uh, uh, issues to to manage. I think it's a good one. It's a plus to the federal government to have cut it down. Uh, it's a good one. Well, we must thank you, Dr. Aliu, for making our time to review the local newspapers with us this morning. We appreciate you. Thank you for having.